I, I just want to... right, welcome. Uh, make sure we get that on the report. Um, I, I just wanted to make a clarifying uh, comment here before we get started. Um, there are two sessions tonight. One of them is the session we're about to start, which is a question and answer session on the site selection process for the school. There's a following session uh, at seven o'clock for any residents that received the notice uh, from Sawyer Road. So that's a session intended for that specific purpose. Um, it's open to the public, but uh, just wanted to make sure that we clarified um, the intent of the two uh, different teams here tonight. So Everyone's welcome to vote. We just I have to make sure we say, next yeah. Time. So if anybody does have questions, um, we will have a, a just a time for that uh, <coughs> during the meeting, um, and we'll, uh, we'll we'll jump right into that. I will say if you do have a question, if you could just um, state your name and then just uh, try to speak up so that everybody on the phone can hear you. Well. Can you all hear us well in the room? Okay. If you ever can't, just raise your hand for us so we know. Thank you. Okay, so we'll jump right into the information that we have here tonight, and I'll turn it over to Jeff Bruno, um, school, to go over the agenda and take a little bit of information. Sure, so um, before we uh, jump into the site selection process and, and how we arrived at, at the ideal site for the unified um, K-3 school, I did wanted to just share with, with folks a little bit about the why behind the project. Um, so if you advance to the next slide, Lisa. So why is it needed? Um, this is not a new uh, challenge for, for Scarborough. So for almost 20 years, um, we've exceeded, the enrollment of, of Scarborough schools has, has really exceeded uh, what our buildings can fit. Uh, particularly at the K-2 level with our three small elementary schools where we've had um, uh, portable classrooms that are being actively used and have been actively used since 2001. Um, also at the middle school, the entire sixth grade is, is in a group of portables clustered outside the middle school that when it was finished and built in the 90s was already too small um, for, for the enrollment in grades six, seven, and eight. So, um, Part of, part of the why really goes back in time into our, our, our current situation. And, and for, for decades, we've been kind of uh, limping along with, with temporary classrooms attached to our buildings in order to um, educate you know, our students and feed, fit them on our, on our school campuses. So um, again, this is not new. Um, this, this solution, this project is a long-term permanent solution uh, to the facilities issue for our um, current enrollment and also uh, our growing enrollment, which we're gonna be talking about a little bit uh, on the next slide. Um, we had just completed uh, this past spring an updated en uh, enrollment study and enrollment projections. Uh, Scarborough has grown significantly over the last 15, 20 years um, and is going, is going to continue to grow. Uh, and, and our enrollment and, and the amount of students that we will be educating in this town will uh, continue to grow over the next 10 years. Let's see if I can get this to advance. Okay, for those that don't know me, my name is Lisa Sawin. I'm an architect with Harriman. I'm also a resident of Scarborough. I'm gonna talk about why or what the solution provides. As Jeff mentioned, this is a K-8 strategic solution. This is looking at alleviating the overcrowding that exists at our primary school and our middle school. It provides adequate educational facilities to meet the, to meet the urgent need to provide educational facilities for a projected student population, which Dan will go over in a minute. And um, it is a K-8 solution, a long-term equitable solution to meet the educational needs of all our K-8 students. Safety and security, layers of safety and security are embedded throughout the design of the project, addressing concerns within the primary schools and also by eliminating the temporary portables, the ones at the middle school, the whole sixth grade has to leave the building to go into the portables and then from the portables, leave those to go back into the building that also eliminates a safety and security concern. Provides equitable travel time. So by having it centrally located, um, and locating all of our schools in close proximity to each other for, uh, provides equitable commute times across all communities within Scarborough, and it provides reduced operating costs. It will have at least 
percent less per square foot in operating costs, and it includes cooling when the K2 schools do not. So that's a big apples to oranges comparison, and we're still saving at least 25%. With you, Dana? Yeah, uh, those of you that don't know me, I'm Dana Fortier. I'm the chair of the building committee. I'm a volunteer and also a resident of Scarborough. Um, the graph that you see in front of you here um, depicts sort of the, the, the deficit of space uh, within the K through three schools. The red line uh, there along the bottom of the chart, just below the white area, is the capacity of the existing primary schools. And the green line at the very top represents the capacity that will be required uh, in order to house students. And this is done by, uh, or was done by an enrollment projection that was done by a specialist that's done this for Scarborough in the past. Um, and the green line uh, from you know, current date to previous dates is historical, uh, the actual historical um, number that, that was achieved. Uh, and the green line going forward from you know, the, the 2023 date is um, what's projected in the future. Uh, it's important to note that the enrollment projections that have been conducted over the last several years and typically done uh, on a frequent basis uh, have been statistically very accurate and have held true to the models that have been projected, even with, um, with the housing growth that we see. Uh, and this also contemplates, uh, contemplates that. So by 2027, um, the result is that there will be uh, no space for the 64 additional students uh, it would require, you know, some uh, some pretty unbelievable things to happen, like you know, more temporary trailers potentially in parking lots to house students. Uh, and um, at the primary schools, we have no more room for portable uh, portable classrooms. Okay, now we're going to go into the site selection process. We have with our with us tonight Elle Palmer, civil engineer from Coral Palmer. To walk us through the site selection process, it's really broken down into three parts. How the site, um, how, which is the site selection process, where, where the site is selected and why it is the best site. Pass it over to Al. Thank you, Lisa. As Lisa indicated, my name's Al Palmer. I work for Coral Palmer. I'm a civil engineer, I have worked in Southern Maine for 38 years. And we've done a number of site selection studies for various projects over that time frame. This slide includes a couple of different items. It includes on the word side of the slide. So right, the right hand side as you're viewing it, the site selection criteria that we worked with the building committee to evaluate the various sites. So that ranged from safety, environmental impacts, location and capacity for future expansion, transportation, safety and traffic, utilities, cost, availability, community involvement, public services, soils and topography, and locally identified criteria. So we had a matrix that we developed of these criteria and they were used to screen potential candidate sites. On the left-hand side of the slide, you'll see kind of some of the uh, milestones that the project looked at. In total, there were 46 different sites evaluated during the process. So as part of that evaluation, we were doing a quick assessment of the candidate sites. Early in the process, we had identified approximately a 25-acre area um, would be a desirable site size site for the project, not knowing any particular constraints on an individual site. If this were a state funded school, the state would fund purchase of up to about a 32 acre site. So that kind of gives you an idea of the size of the property that would be required. We had identified potentially being able to do it on 25 acres, depending on the shape, configuration, topography, um, state funded project would fund up to potentially 32 acres. So somewhere between 20 and 30 acres would be necessary. We looked at sites that range down to 15 acres or even 10 acres. If they were adjacent to another property that could be assembled and put together to have a site of adequate size. So there were 
about in excess of 30 meetings over a 12 month period where those sites were evaluated. We use the 10 criteria that you see on the left to identify and screen the candidate sites. But then we also worked with the building committee to consider locally important criteria. And those were things such as a centralized location, equitable bus time, and a family-friendly approach um, and sense of arrival. As you know, Scarborough is one of the largest geographic size communities in Southern Maine. You have a very large area that will be sending students to this school. So one of the concerns was trying to maintain bus rides that would not exceed an hour. When you start looking at going from West Scarborough all the way to Pine Point, up to Higgins Beach, it was critical to the building committee to have a central location for the school to try to minimize the impact to the various communities within the town, but also recognizing that parent drop-off and pickup is a fact of life in today's educational environment. And knowing that this school would be operating at the same time frame as the Wentworth School, having proximity to the existing municipal campus. So if a parent were dropping off a second grader and a fourth grader, that that would be a, a reasonable drive between the facilities so that they could accomplish that task and not get a child to school too early. There were four sites that were identified as the, I'll call it the leading candidates. Uh, those were screened in more detail. Massing diagrams were prepared for each of those sites, including even a few of the other sites that were considered. One of the largest factors in evaluating sites was what properties would, would be available. Um, Scarborough is, as you know, is a very in-demand community and the school department was actually competing with developers who were interested in some of the other sites. So a site, a number of sites were already off the market because they were under purchase and sales agreements for developers or during the process were signed to a purchase and sales agreement by a developer and were um, therefore not available. The next slide talks about an overview of the site selection process and highlights um, on the right, again, some of those criteria and what was most important, uh, but also on the left-hand side provides an overview of the candidate sites, the four top candidate sites and how they all scored on those various criteria. I'm just gonna kind of ground people in what this is showing because I can see that it's kind of hard to see on some of the screens, but along this side in gray are the site selection criteria. The green column is the down site. The yellow column is another site that was in the top four, which is called the Foley site. The red column was a site called Two Rod site. And the fourth column, which is in purple or blue, um, depending on what screen you're looking at, is the Grandin site. Those within the red box were the top criteria um, that kind of rose to the top in addition to the local criteria um, through the site selection process. So as Lisa indicated, this kind of gives you a graphic sense of how each of those candidate sites stacked up against the criteria. Were they in keeping with the criteria that the building committee was using to evaluate sites? As you can see, frankly, none of the sites ended up with a check mark as being the perfect site. Um, the downs on the far left has the most check marks, but as an example, soils was something that we knew were gonna be an issue on the downs. Uh, because of the underlying soils, we knew from past experience that ground improvement would be required to allow for the building construction. 
frankly, that's an issue for almost every site of size in the town of Scarborough. It's either soft, uh, loose sand, bedrock, or clay that will consolidate. So that is a criteria that we knew was gonna be a challenge on all the sites. But as you can see on the left, as Lisa indicated, was all of the uh, criteria, the top criteria are really the ones that were most important from the local standpoint. And then along the bottom of the table, yep, as Lisa's pointing out, um, and that screen's way far away from us um, as we're viewing it. You guys can see better behind us. Yeah. The, we provided the building committee in the town council with an anticipated land development cost. What would be the relative cost differential between the candidate sites from a site construction standpoint? This does not include any building construction. It's only on-site and off-site construction costs. Items such as clearing and grubbing, utilities, earthwork, bedrock removal if necessary, ground improvement below the building, retaining walls. All of those factors were considered to develop an approximate cost for the site so that they could be compared to see how do they stack up relative and you can see below that um, the, the land cost. It's easier to look behind John um, and see that. So the only one that had a known land cost was the Scarborough Down site. That was the site that the town council authorized an appraisal for and was, um, as you can see, the 7.32 million. So as you're going across the downsite for land development is approximately 28 and a half million. That includes the actual <clears throat> site construction, access construction, utilities. It includes all the soft costs for the project, uh, which includes it, an escalation factor. We're budgeting this project in 2023, but it won't be constructed until and completed until 2027 assuming a positive referendum. So we had to build in an escalation of construction costs to account for that time period, project contingencies, application fees, all of those items are included in that overall cost. But that was done on a consistent basis going across, and you can see it goes from 28 and a half million to 30.2 to 35.7. 30 and basically, um, 40.8. 40.8. So as the sites go across, they got increasingly more expensive. Two Rod Road and the Running Hill Road site are both on the Me, west. Grandin. Grandin site are both on the west side of the interstate. There is very limited public utilities on the west side of the interstate. There is no public sewer west of the interstate. So those sites, we had to look at extending public sewer to the west side. On Two Rod Road, it included extending public water to the west side. There is limited public water near the Grandin site, but it would have to be extended onto the site. And the Grandin site has significant topographic relief. Um, it's a very hilly site. And there was going to be significant bedrock removal and retaining walls to build that site. So those are the factors that we looked at in developing those approximate costs. So as Al mentioned, um, multiple landowners were, were approached and there were several that were not interested in selling, um, including um, uh, some on this list as we found out. Um, other sites were available, but as Al mentioned, throughout the process became unavailable. Um, so just like buy, trying to buy a house in Scarborough, we were finding that land would come on and go off as quick as it came on. Um, and ultimately, the Downs was chosen from a list of 46 potential sites. As you can see, it best aligned with the criteria and had the lowest developmental cost. Um, Al, do you want to go through kind of the location and why this is the best site? So 
The, the site location on the downs is on the easterly side of the site. The downs is about a 550 acre parcel. It's on the easterly side of, the, of their property um, between kind of outside of the existing practice racetrack, the old practice track that was on the, the outside perimeter. This site was a very central location, uh, the proximity to the municipal campus and an operational efficiency. One of the things that was very unique on this site is that it would allow for access from four different quadrants, a northerly access, a southerly act of northerly access being Payne Road, a southerly access being Route One, a westerly access connecting to Hagus Parkway, and potentially an easterly access connecting to Sawyer Road. And as noticed or discussed earlier, we're going to have additional discussion regarding the Sawyer Road connection later in the second meeting. But the ability to have four different access points allows the traffic to be dispersed in the greatest fashion available. One of the issues that exists on the existing municipal campus is the middle school has one way in, one way out. And that poses challenges, both from a public safety standpoint, as well as capacity and traffic queuing and those factors. The other item that is unique to this site is with a Sawyer Road connection, you actually can get between the down site and the municipal campus without having to go on to either a collector road or an arterial. Roads are classified under different categories by the main department of transportation and the federal highway, uh, federal highways. Route one is an arterial. Payne Road is a collector. One of the things we try and do on any design is to minimize forcing traffic onto an arterial or onto a collector road if they're going to another location or another site. By using Sawyer Road and coming up through the municipal complex off of Sawyer, you actually can get between the two sites without having to go on to any of the major Toward, um, collector roads or arterials. Payne Road, Vegas Parkway, Route 140. Or Route 1. Um, utilities. Utilities are all available on the site or available by extension within the downs, proximity to public safety, and um, it actually has the least environmental impact of all the sites that were considered under the shortlist relative to wetland impacts. Um, and there was a willing seller. It also allows for future expansion as well. <clears throat> and so just to, I, we want to be cognizant of time because it's most important that we get to questions. So we're going to go a little bit faster here. By no means are we trying to rush through this information. If you have questions after, ask us but we wanna reserve as much time for questions. So all those things that Al just took us through, the next couple of slides just highlight certain aspects. So proximity to the municipal campus, operational efficiency, and proximity to public safety. So that's what this slide is showing. You have the unified primary school site. You can see it hatched right here. This is the middle school. This is Wentworth. This is the high school. This is the public safety building. Central location, equitable bus times, and ability to disperse traffic. So what Al was saying, <clears throat> central location was really important. What we've put on here is it's called the town centroid. And what that is, is it's the geographic center of Scarborough. Um, and so you can see this is the center. Here is the campus with Wentworth, the middle school, and the high school. Here is the proposed unified primary school site. And then highlighting the four points of access. Um, so we have the central location, this helps with equitable bus times um, and disperses the traffic via four exit points. More on the traffic, the traffic flow and commute time were some of the prioritized criteria in the selection, um, site selection process. It's something we heard over and over again from the community was important. Um, and uh, with the downs being essentially located, as I said before, um, provides equitable commute times and we can disperse the traffic. So just kind of reiterating that that was a, a key 
um, point. Um, the district um, transportation department, as well as the assistant superintendent, ran um, some different models for busing. Um, really looking at the proximity to the municipal campus allows them to be able to run K-6 bus routes. And the benefits for this is it streamlines time um, parents spend supervising bus pickups and drop-offs. So if you have a kid coming on a K-2 bus and then a Wentworth bus and others, you might be standing out at the bus stop for a long period of time. This essentially allows a K-6 run, which allows them to pick up more kids in a geographic area, reducing the number of stops making that more efficient. They have a modeling software that they ran and they wanted to then check the modeling software. So they ran the routes and the modeling software. They got the data, which you can see in the bullet points here below highlighted. And I'll read those in a minute so people can hear them. Then they put the, the buses out in circulation and timed it. They wanted to make sure that the software was right. What the evaluation identified is using the 18 bus drivers and this coming year students, seven bus routes will not change in duration running these new routes. Six routes may increase two to nine minutes. Five bus routes will decrease by three to eight minutes and the longest current bus time will remain the same. And then as Al said, proximity of utilities, if this graphic, if folks can see it, you see a lot of green and a lot of blue on your left hand side. That is public water and sewer. That line that you see pretty much down one third of the page is Interstate 95. Everything on the other side does not have, except for a few exceptions, right up in, in here, there's a couple lines of water. There's no public water or sewer on that side of 95. And Al, correct me if I'm wrong, the interstate requires us to go under the interstate to serve those properties? The turnpike authority requires you to bore under the turnpike and install a dual pipe system, an exterior casing pipe and an interior carrier pipe. And it has to be able to go at least four, accommodate four lanes in each direction. So you're looking at a total crossing that's in, on the order of 250 feet that has to be installed by um, a directional drilling methodology. Very feasible, but very expensive. Um, so this is the, the cost that I went over earlier, um, showing the development cost difference between the sites. Um, I won't spend too much time on this. It essentially shows the incremental difference um, between those. And then um, I'm going to go quickly through some of the cost um, in the, the site and the offsite. Al is going to get into this and a lot more detail in the second meeting if folks um, stick around, um, but I want everybody to have a full context for this evening's meeting. The site is what you see outlined. It, it almost looks like some, you know, um, I don't know what shape we call this, but um, an outline with maybe a little leg up here. Um, that is the site within the downs. Um, so essentially up here is Sawyer Road right here where you can see that, uh, maybe you can't see it for those because that video right here where you kind of see me circling right around there is the middle school site. Um, and then you can see the old practice racetrack of Scarborough Down. So when we say it's between the easterly um, you know, edge of the practice track and the easterly property line of the Downs, that's right where we're talking about. Um, the site cost and um, the school site land cost is $7.3 million. That does include title insurance. Um, so the actual cost from the landowner was about 7.2 and the 7.3 includes the title insurance. Oh, and to Alice's point, this is 21.87 acres. Um, so we were um, trying to be as efficient with the property as possible but also able to maintain future expansion. You can see the enlargement here. This is the building itself. We have um, parent um, uh, drop-offs, two of them for each uh, school within a school and a bus drop-off. Um, and then um, service areas um, and before and after school pick up and drop off. <coughs> so anticipated offsite improvements. Um, these are the Sawyer Road improvements. Al, if you can walk us quickly through these, this would be helpful. So there's three categories of improvements that we've included for Sawyer Road, <laughs> capacity improvements, pedestrian and bicycle improvements, and traffic calming and speed control. Starting 
plan north at 114 is construction of a 200 foot left turn lane from Route 114 onto Sawyer Road. And we're anticipating that that inter intersection would be signalized. Sawyer Road um, at 114 would have separate left and right turn lanes exiting Sawyer on to Gorm Road. Today, you've got one exit lane. So if somebody wants to turn left, it's blocking the right turns. There would be separate left and right turn lanes from Sawyer Road and Route 114 to Sawgrass, we would construct an eight foot sidewalk with curbing drainage for pedestrian, but that would also serve as a multi-use path so that if there were young children using bikes, they wouldn't have to be in the road. Um, Sawyer Road from Sawgrass to Oakdale and to Durant, we would widen the sidewalk to eight feet. Sawyer at Route 1, Right now, there's a short right turn lane. We would extend that to 200 feet at the signalized intersection. And then within Sawyer Road, we would have three strategically located race speed table crosswalks to try to assist with the speed control. Potential locations might include uh, Durant Drive, Track View Terrace, um, Preservation Way. Those are three that are, have been discussed. There may be other locations that we consider and add, uh, but we were looking at a, a means to try to assist in slowing down traffic. The next is e Easterly Access Road. Um, one of the questions we wanted to uh, address was um, why is an Easterly Access needed. Um, it provides a fourth entry point to the school, uh, critical for emergency response times and access, while also helping to disperse traffic among the different parts of Scarborough. The Easterly access point allows also allows buses, school officials, etc. to move from the main campus to the unified school efficiently. <laughs> Do you want to walk us through what the costs are based on and then talk a little bit about um, uh, the Easterly access? Sure. So... Okay, this was the cost. What we've done is we've looked at a 26 foot wide paved road with curbing, an eight foot sidewalk on one side. The, as it exits onto Sawyer Road, there would be separate left and right turn lanes. We would upgrade the water and provide sewer service Currently, we have budgeted underground single phase power and all driveways would be reconstructed uh, within the right of way and access to utilities. So service for stubs for water and sewer doesn't mean that people would have to connect to them, but they would be available so that the road wouldn't have to be dug up in the future when they elect to connect. Um, anticipated offsite improvements within the downs. You want to talk briefly about this and then we'll move on to questions, Al? So, this slide depicts a contribution of approximately $2.99 million that the town uh, would make with, for improvements within the downs. They're ba basically allow, uh, providing the direct connection to Payne Road through an upgrade to Paddock Drive. There's a Roundabout that is proposed near the proposed Costco, extension of Center Street. There's two streets adjacent to the school, um, and then a street going beyond the school towards Trackview Terrace. The town worked with the Downs to determine an equitable allocation and sharing of the costs, and that totals approximately 2.9 million. There were costs that were unique to the school that influenced how that would be done. Um, on the northerly side of the, of the school, there is a road that is proposed to connect to the cottages at Sawyer. For the Downs development, that only required single phase power, but for the school development, that required three phase power. That was an incremental cost, and that was no, um, determined as part of that cost sharing. Mm -hmm. So um, we're just going to put these up here, um, where to learn more. There are continuing weekly Q&A sessions. I do want to highlight 
The one after the session um, <clears throat> is on uh, Sawyer Road. Um, Tuesday the 24th, there will be another one. Um, sorry, this is, uh, I, sorry about that. Tuesday the 24th, uh, October the 17th, there will be one um, at Eight Corners. This is in-person only. This is a tour, an overview of the project. Tuesday the 24th, we will have another location and site selection one. And then we change the days of the week. We've been doing Tuesdays throughout this process. So I just wanna highlight Monday the 30th at Blue Point, Wednesday, November 1st at Pleasant Hill and Monday, November 6th at the Council Chambers. If you wanna stay informed, there's a QR code to get information about the projects via email and there is a website. We have information about what the project is. If people want to stay after, we're happy to go through that, but we wanna reserve the rest of this time for Q&A. Thank you, so we'll, that will turn it over to anyone in the room or online that has questions. My name is Jack Fay. I live at 14 Mulberry Lane. In your presentation, you said that you don't want the bus ride to be any longer than one hour. You also said that you're consolidating a lot of the other schools together with the kindergarten students. But you got kindergarten through third grade is coming to the new school. They're going to be on the road for as much as an hour. And those are the youngest students in the whole school system. They don't get enough sleep now as it is. And because they're going to be picking up more students, they're going to be on the road longer. The Blue Point area, they got to come up Route 1 if they're coming to Sawyer Road. Eight traffic lights during the worst time for commuting on Route 1. I don't understand why you want to use Sawyer Road at all, because there's 221 individual homes on Sawyer Road and a condo complex. When the police did a survey a few years ago, it's close to 850 cars a day go down Sawyer Road. You're going to be adding another 3,000 cars a day. And I got to say, I'm looking at your presentation. When is the other shoe going to drop? When are you going to start to put a road through from Sawyer Road up to the middle school to make it easier to clink up? Because that's obvious what you people are planning, not on this project, sometime in the future. And that's going to be another cost factor. I just don't see why Sawyer Road is so needed because we're already, it's a private road. Nobody living on that road or off the road can access any place in Scarborough unless they drive on Sawyer Road. That is a collector road. That's what we do. And you're trying to turn into a main access into the downs for the school, by the CPD requirements, they don't want to have any collector roads providing shortcuts into Costco and the rest of the dams. That's exactly what you're going to do. People are going to turn down Sawyer Road, cut in through Trackview Terrace, and go right into the downs and go to shopping or whatever. That's exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. After the fact, it's going to be a little difficult. Now, I'm trying to stay within the guidelines of your school presentation. Um, basically, I just think that you said you were going to try and cut down on the school bus rides. That's why I bring this up right now. And I just don't see how that's happening. Um, well, I was just going to address the, the bus ride times wouldn't change. Really yeah, yeah, so the bus ride time wouldn't change materially, right? So some how long does a blue point run, run take right now? What's that? How long is a blue point run for all the kindergartens? I think the longest ride is 15 something minutes, Jeff. Is that correct? Yes. What? what? 50, 50 minutes. 50 minutes. No. <laughs> That's with all the no. stops in between. <laughs> sure. Well, yes. Yeah. And now you're going to, is that a blue point area? <laughs> okay, so now you're going to pick up more students in the blue point area. It's going to take the same amount of time. You've got kindergarten through third grade. Going to be out there for 55 minutes, you just said. One way. One way. That, that's that's the current ride right. time. Yeah. Okay, and you're not going to change the current ride right time. That's right. what your presentation said. Yeah. That's not an improvement. If I had a little kid in Blue Point School, I'd be happy because it's going to take four years to do this. Well, if you will be happy. <laughs> um, Dana, this is Shannon. May I? Can I speak in for just a second? Can you hear me? Yep. You weren't Perfect. recognized. Yet. Thank you. Uh, oh, is that okay? <laughs> Go ahead, Shannon. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, I This is Shannon Lindstrom. I'm this current school board chair. Um, I just wanted to address the question about the bus routes. So yes, what happened is our current number of bus drivers actually went out and drove this route. So certainly to your point, there's going to be 250 more students. But if we we already have bus stops in the current neighborhoods, right, that are going to the to the current schools. So what they did was they went to the they ran the current routes, but they went and and ran the routes going to toward the new schools. So that is where those numbers come from. So the challenge or the the suggestion or the hope was that we would keep it under an hour. What they found is that seven bus routes would not change in duration at all. There are six that would increase from a, a range of two to nine minutes. And then there was five routes that would actually decrease by three to eight minutes. So, uh, and, and the reason yep, it's not, I don't know if Lisa, if you can scroll back to the slide. Did they drive that during commuting hour? Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. When did they drive it? When did they drive the buses to see how long it would take? During the commuting hours, during the pickup yes. time. So during the scheduled pickup time. I don't know. So they, they ran the software and they checked the software with the- I'm bus sorry. Bus. I don't want to hear about software, okay? I'm trying to- I spent, yeah, but Our software is very flexible yeah. yep, and can right. be wrong. Our transportation- about the actual people driving- Our transportation buses. director has been doing this for a long time and was 100% part of this and very much involved. And you're talking about all new bus routes, right? Because we're taking kids from four different locations now to one. And- to, so that's going to change all the routes and and took a lot of time and a lot of thought to redo the bus routes to try and see, OK, what is what are they going to be the impact to kids? And the fact that you've got a situation where there are seven that don't change, there are six that actually slightly increase in time and six that decrease. And overall, you're not elongating bus routes for kids um, is, is a very, very positive thing and, and actually um, was frankly, a relief, because anytime you talk about redoing all of the bus routes for K to four, for K to six, K to eight, it's, it's, there's a lot of factors to, to, to take into play there. And um, there was a lot of time and thought spent um, trying to figure out, okay, how would this change things? Because obviously this is, this is a massive project. Correct me if I'm wrong, current schools of K through two, Right. So you are taking the K through two students in four years. OK. And you're making them ride a lot longer than they currently do with the neighborhood school. Some yes, some no, depending on where you live. Right. Because they're all going to a different location now. I think and I think the so. point about I'm John Anderson, I'm the uh, town council chair. I think ultimately the point is this site and the way reason we chose this site was to try and keep bus rides as equitable as we could. If this was a different site, like some of the other ones that were shared, it would be much worse for some of those students. So again, at the end of the day, you know, what this site does provide is that equitable bus time. The lesser of four reasons. Yeah, that's the, the truth. Okay, other questions? You wanna go row I'm by row? Let me start, start in the second row here. So I guess you're- I'm Ann Green, I live on Mulberry Lane, which is off of Sawyer. I'm a grandmother. I have a fourth grader and a sixth grader at Wentworth and at the middle school. Um, the busing, bus stop and pickup is a zoo. You're right. Um, another factor you haven't talked about, though, is the bus stops. Um, K through four, <coughs> K through five can have, a, their, their bus stop can be no longer than a quarter mile away. If you're in sixth grade or older, your bus stop can be a half a mile away. So your parents are still going to be dealing with bus stops that are two different bus stops. They're not together. You're talking about making it easier for parents. Have you factored in the distances and where your bus stops will be so that you don't have that interference? Because that's a really big problem with yeah. parents trying yeah. to get the kids there. Plus, the older kids are have backpacks full of books that probably weigh up to 50 pounds, maybe more than that, that they're carting all day long. Sixth graders have to cart their backpacks all day long if they go in and out of the building over there. And if they get dropped off a half a mile from home and they're having to do that, so are you looking at equitable bus stops? 
for the kids too? Or is that something that you have not talked about? No, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very important. Um, to make sure that it's safe. And, there, and we've got this year for, I think for the first time in a long time, actually more ridership, more students riding the buses. Um, you know, through COVID, there are much fewer kids riding buses each year. And this past year, we've actually significantly increased. There's 17 buses coming out of uh, the middle school and none of them are full. The ridership does go down when you get into uh, middle school and high school. That's, that's pretty difficult in terms of the percentage of kids who are riding the bus. Um, to, answer, to answer your question, though, about the distances, so they ran bus stops yeah. of various ages, but looking at a K-6 range, so it would have to accommodate the distance of the youngest person if they're K-6 on that bus. Yeah. Okay, we'll go to the next question. Yes. Hi, I'm Don Cushing, and I'm a candidate for the Valley Council. And I have an observation question. Uh, does it seem to me that folks who live around the Sawyer Road are going to be persuaded that the changes to Sawyer Road were a good idea? And that potentially risks the entire project. So a question that I have is, is this whole Sawyer Road thing a done deal? In other words, if you move this bond, does do the changes to Sawyer Road have to take place? Or is there room to go back to the drawing and take the concerns of folks who live in that area more into account? And I don't know if that's a concern. I want to answer that at the next. Can you repeat the question? So the, the question was, um, do we need the access to Sawyer Road, or could, could actually, the project? Actually, that's not the point. Okay, could you, could could you repeat speak it? Up I, think you, I think you've made a wonderful case from your point of view that we need the access to Sawyer Road. I think well, that the Downs are, needs the access to Sawyer well, Road. Well, let me finish up. Yeah. That there are a lot of folks here who. <laughs> Don't agree with that point. And that there is a lot of baby that can get thrown out with the bathwater around this Sawyer Road issue. So, my question is not whether you all think it's a good idea. I think you've done a wonderful job, done your due diligence, you have a lot of facts, but that may not change people's opinion who live in that area. So, my question is. If I vote for the referendum and the $160 million bond, is there a chance that we could return and revisit the Sawyer Road question in a way that would accommodate better the needs of some of the people here? That's my question. So what, what, I, what I would say is that um, easterly access is part of the <clears throat> land deal. So there is a requirement that we need to create easterly access to close on the site and so in my mind there is a need what al is going to talk about is the future where perhaps there's an option where we don't need to go through sawyer road um, but it's probably more of a long-term option and so right now the referendum does include and contemplate some sort of easterly access that is still not decided so we'll, what we shared tonight is kind of the primary option that we went went out with for doing cost estimates and bidding to get that $160 million estimate, but there are other options that we can still explore. We do have to make a decision though by December 31st where that easterly access is going to come from. So essentially, yes, this is, I would say, this is included and easterly access to the site is part of the decision that people need to make when they're making their choice about supporting this project or not on the bond. So going down the road. Don't have of yeah. in front of me. Well, Can I ask you some some distances on this Sawyer Road on 114? How wide is the road right now? The two little lanes. What's the distance from side to side on the two lanes? On Sawyer Road. Sawyer Road. It, Sawyer Road varies. Typically, it's 11 to 12 foot travel lanes. The shoulder varies considerably. There is no shoulder. Just, 
Yeah, where the the wet land land. There's there's areas where shoulders are as little as six inches. I'm just That's asking from tar, tar to tar. What is this? What is the distance across? Just just the beginning of Sawyer Road when you turn. What is it from tar to one side to the other? Twenty four to twenty six feet. Okay. These turning lanes that you're talking about, is that two turning lanes not included the two go forward lanes? So is it gonna be four lanes? Three. Three lanes. And sidewalks? Sidewalk on one side. Okay, so what's the, so so what's the distance now? We've gone from 24 to what? It With would be 24 plus 11, 35, 35, 43, 47. From the Curve to back of side. <laughs> but the two lanes are only at the intersection of Sawyer and 114, which is what I believe she asked. I don't, I don't understand three lanes. If you have a right turning lane and a left turning lane. At, so if you're on Sawyer at the intersection of 114, right. you would have exiting onto 114, a left turn lane, a right turn lane. And you would have one lane for traffic entering Sawyer from 114. Entering Sawyer. I think we're gonna we're gonna yeah. Okay. yeah we're gonna, we're gonna keep going with questions. I'm yeah. just gonna remind everyone we have another session that's starting, but uh, any site selection specific questions. Okay, we got them. So I just now. have one question yeah. about the site location. This is a done deal with the doubts. You I mean you you presented these top four choices but then said that they weren't even available. So I don't even know why they got in the top priority as two, choices. Two Rod Road was available. Yeah. So then Two Rod Road was available. And that's yeah. the one on the other side of 95. Correct. Okay. The so Grand and, the and, the and one, property was also- It was available. Potentially one. available. But, but you can put a cost down on that. It, uh, so the, the, only pro, the only land that was, um, that. I'm sorry, appraised. but appraised, thank you, was the, uh, was done by a professional appraiser was the, the Downs property because that was the one that was selected. Exactly. So if we wanted to get appraisals on other properties, we would have to have a border defined on the property. So for example, like with the Grandin property, it's a very large tract of land. We would not take all of it. So we would have to define the piece that we wanted, come to an agreement with the developer that currently had it under option. Uh, to purchase a piece of that property. So uh, that's why appraisals were not done. So they weren't really considered sites. If they, were, they weren't really they were. considered. No, not if you yeah, didn't yeah. do an appraisal. No. There we go. We can agree. We can agree. You know what you can sign it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, gentleman back there with the shirt. Make sure it's good. It's good. I'm not John Phelps. I live right here in uh, Sawyer Road, 15 Imperial Lane. Uh, just a, sort of an observation here. Um, I think one of the problems that I have with this is this notion that centralization is good. So Scarborough is unique town. West Scarborough is very different from the beach area, et cetera, et cetera. Where all these schools that have been there for a long time exist, they're part of neighborhoods. They're part of identity of the town. I think it's very interesting. What I don't understand is why one of these areas hasn't been taken aside to potentially expand. And the real issue that needs expansion is over here, the middle school. Yes. So why are we talking about building 160 $200 million over there when we could probably do 80 million mm -hmm. out at Pleasant Hill, put another 50 down at the middle school and call it a day. Yeah. You don't have an explanation for that. Certainly, certainly appreciate your, appreciate you your I'd like to hear what the explanation is. Yeah. Just I can, I can provide I think you. everybody else would too. So those, what you talked about has been explored in great detail and has been provided uh, as information. Uh, certainly happy to spend some time with whoever's interested on it. Um, these have been things that have been presented in many meetings uh, over the course of the past several months. We cannot expand the existing schools. There is no more room. 
not true. That's there true. is not a significant word. structural word. capacity. Yeah, I'm worried. Yeah. It's, it's not true. Disingenuous. It's, 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 it's disingenuous. If I can project, if I respectfully, if I can, could I? Like you can, can, but it's, just, it's disingenuous. Um, and, and I would just ask everybody, let's let's keep this, let's try to keep this as respectful as possible. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody's here trying to do something that isn't in the best interest of the town. So, you, the, the existing school sites are not; they will not provide enough capacity for the growth that's expected. The, the line that I showed uh, to satisfy the capacity that's needed for the long term. With the solution that's being proposed, we are moving a grade out of the middle school to alleviate the capacity challenge that the middle school currently experiences. So the entire sixth grade right now goes to school uh, in portable classrooms. By moving the sixth grade to Wentworth and moving the third grade out of Wentworth, uh, yeah, or I'm sorry, fifth grade out of uh, third grade out of Wentworth to the consolidated primary school, you create a shift that allows you to take advantage of the middle school without having to significantly expand it. So the, the, the fact of the matter is when you look at the site, the existing sites, if you look at how big they are, and we have done this with architectural designs to try to fit in the three existing school sites, fit what's needed to, to support the capacity uh, that's anticipated over the next few years. It doesn't work. So just to add to that, we'll, yeah, we, we can direct you to the business yeah. study that was done showing how they can they be expanded. Yes, but they can't hold all the capacity. So it shows expansion on all three, and then building a fourth. And it goes through all the detail as to what that would cost, how much more it would cost to operate all of that. And we can provide you that information yeah. afterwards. Because I think you'll find it helpful. So just from a logistical perspective, we're at time for the next session and we need to switch the technology. So you finish with some questions for this session. Well, you guys use 40 minutes of the question and answer time. My question is, my question is, is my understanding is that Mr. Palmer's firm is one of the principal consulting engineers for the Downs. Didn't yeah. the committee think that there was just a slight bit of conflict of interest in using the Downs consulting engineer to, to help with site selection? The lo and behold finds that the only place that we can build a school in Scarborough is the Downs. There's not, there's not just a hint of a conflict of interest here. So the committee was comprised of community <laughs> members. And I will say that Al is, and I don't mean Al is, I don't mean to disparage him or his firm. Okay, I'm talking about an appearance of a conflict of interest. And so that's why we had multiple people on the committee that were comprised of community members, town staff, school department staff that were the people that were reviewing the information and making. Okay. Decisions. You came up with cost estimates for expansions. So. Al is only one of the, Al's firm is only one of the elements of this. Uh, Lisa's firm provided uh, cost estimates as well. And then you have people on the committee that have this uh, profession as a background that are reviewing the information. So I would there hope is, that there when is we start this balance. process again, yeah. we start with a clean slate, with a clean architect, with a clean engineering firm that doesn't have all this preconceived notion that there's only one place in town that we can solve the educational needs of Scarborough. Yeah. Yeah. Continue the dialogue and questions, but I do want to switch the technology because there might be other people who would benefit yep. from the conversation and that might be logging in. So I don't want to lose the opportunity for them to hear. So if we could just have a quick, where's Peter, a two to three minute swap over in technology and then rather rather than, than digging straight into the Sawyer Road stuff that was planned, we can continue the question and answer. Um, a lot of the Sawyer Road stuff was touched on. I don't know, Al, if there's anything you would want to. There's a few points I can go through quick. Okay. So why don't we do a quick technology check? And if you have questions, just write them down and we'll get to you, get to you eventually. And for those who are attending online, I put the link for the second meeting in the chat. The people that are joining at seven are.
Oh, that's, you can 